When you work in parish ministry, you know that our best efforts to serve are often disrupted by increasing needs in the face of dwindling resources. It is sometimes hard to act with a sense of abundance and imagination. Ella es Terry Hunt, miembro de nuestro comité miembro y miembro de la Asociación de Educación Religiosa. Terry nos comparte lo difícil que puede ser en este momento sir servir, servir con imaginación en las parroquias. Pero la ventana de detrás de, nuestra, de nosotros pueden ser un metáfora para ver una manera nueva. The window behind us, however, can serve as a, a metaphor for revitalizing our ministry. It was always a part of this church, but if you came here after the church was built, you wouldn't see it. The low wall behind me extended all the way up and hid this beautiful window entitled The Canticle of the Sun. Este muro ocultó la ventana hasta que se rompió. It wasn't until decades later that the wall was taken down that this beautiful stained glass window was visible for the, to the whole church. Several years ago, our next speaker, Sheila Austin, was challenged by her pastor to break down a different sort of wall in her deeply indebted pa parish in the urban core of Syracuse, New York. Heeding the call to go beyond the walls of the church and truly see the need in the community, Sheila went from feeling fear and aversion for the homeless to walking with them side by side on her journey. Her parish was transformed through the power of compassionate ministry, and today she is president of Emmaus Ministries, an independent nonprofit that works in collaboration with its founding church just a few blocks away. A native of Syracuse, uh, who was a nurse for 20 years serving in intensive care, emergency room, and operating room care, she eventually became a clinical nurse. She volunteered in hospice care for five years and served her parish for, uh, for 15 years as a lector, Eucharistic minister, and sacristan. She served as the chair of her, the liturgy committee, probably to take after her big sister, Lorinda Irwin, who assists in our own office of worship. Sheila began Emmaus Ministries in 2008 where every day they transform lives with the power of Christ's love. So we invite before us today, Sheila Austin. Welcome. Demos la bienvenida Sheila Austin, Presidente de Emmaus Ministries. Good afternoon. If you don't mind, I'm gonna stand down here. I'm a little more comfortable here. Um, I am thrilled to be here, and I want to thank uh, the diocese of, or the Archdiocese of Minneapolis, St. Paul, um, Archbishop Hebda, and Julia Kors for all the work that you did to help make this be a possibility for me to be here. Um, we're going to start... There we go. Thank you. Okay. So as uh, Julie mentioned, uh, I am a nurse, and I also need to share a little bit of a background so that you have a little perspective of how daunting of this uh, opportunity and uh, ministry was for me. And uh, it basically is about how we as a church go beyond the brick and mortar. Now, these are not things I understood at the time. Please don't, don't misunderstand me. These are things that I learned along the way. Um, but we're going to talk about how do we bring the church to the people that are literally outside the walls. So a little bit of a personal journey uh, for me that led to a major transformation and uh, conversion uh, basically started with chaos and then we went to comfort and then a bit of confusion. So what that means is as far as the chaos, um, like many other uh, families in, in our society, 
uh, we did come from a broken family and uh, there was a lot of stress and upsetness and uh, unheaval uh, ways in our family at the time, but it all works out for the greater good. God has a plan for each and every one of us. And our mother died when uh, she was 44, so we were quite young, and trying to work through a divorce and uh, how to just move forward from all this, which was quite difficult. And um, so on my mother's Beth deathbed, she wanted to know what I was going to do. And I said, well, I'm going to get married and have a family. She says, no, you're not. And she says, you're going to go to school. You've got to learn how to do something. And I remember literally looking around the hospital room, and I'm thinking, well, I might as well try this. I've been in the hospital here for about nine months, so it was the most familiar thing to me. It was not because I was a passionate person and that I wanted to go into uh, the healthcare profession and really help people. It just seemed like a quick answer that I could give her and then maybe I could move on from there. But um, it suited me well. And it led me on to be able to uh, learn skills and, and learn an aspect about caring for people that I would not have been able to do with that before. Um, along the way, as Julie mentioned, uh, I worked in intensive care and the operating room and open heart and uh, really had a wonderful career. I was very blessed and I learned a lot and uh, I also met my husband. So uh, along with that, uh, his name was Lester, he has passed away now, but uh, he was a good man. He was uh, an anesthesiologist. He was successful in, in his life and what he was doing. And so imagine that. A um, little girl who didn't know what she was doing met somebody and uh, provided uh, a wonderful life for me and uh, showed me things that I would not have seen before, gone places I wouldn't have gone before, and could really experience life to its fullness. And um, we had a beautiful life. Um, but along the way, as I need to backtrack a little bit, uh, during this period of chaos, I also stopped going to church. It wasn't because anything really terrible had happened. Um, I think just amidst the, the chaos, I, I, uh, there was no focus for me. There was nobody making sure I went to church. So. And as I got more involved in my nursing, I had a lot of good reasons for not going to church. I had worked the night before, got to work the afternoon of, so I was finding excuses to justify why I wasn't in church. So I'm in, living in this wonderful life and uh, learning things, and I found that I, as blessed as I was in this life, I was not happy. Um, it sounds like I'm being kind of a brat, and you know, in a way, I probably was, because if you think about it, I had everything I needed. I wouldn't have wanted for anything else, but why was I not happy? I couldn't understand it. And so years after years after years, and I'm trying to snuff down this little urge in me that it's because you're not going to church. And I wanted to ignore it because now we're getting to be 20 and 30 years away from being at church. And how do I ever get myself back? How do, how do I explain who, who I am and where I came from and where have I been now for 20 years? So I started to realize that in this world and in in this life of comfort, I was really a very, very, unhappy person. I, was, I knew I was blessed, I was grateful, but I wasn't happy, something was missing. So once I became willing to acknowledge it was because I had left church that um, I, I was trying to find this path back to church. And it's difficult when you're away for a long time because 
I didn't even remember the mass parts. There was so much I felt completely ignorant about and embarrassed about. So I go church hunting and find that uh, the parish near where we were living at the time uh, was opening up volunteers for the music uh, ministry. And I thought, oh, that's a really good way to get back to church. Um, I can be off kind of in a little group. Um, I'll act like I've been there all along. And um, I won't have to explain who I am. I'm just in the choir and I belong here. The problem is I never sang before and I never played an instrument. God bless that folk choir. Um, but I knew I was in the right place because that first rehearsal, which was open to everybody, um, they started in prayer. And I realized that that's, I felt like I was home. So years go on, and I am becoming now um, the volunteer of St. James. I would do anything, go anywhere, work on anything, because I could. I had a comfortable life. So I became the, the, the model volunteer and doing various different things. And um, lo and behold, in 2008, Father John Mano came to St. James Parish. This was his first uh, position as administrator of the parish. And he was sent to St. James, which is located on the south side of Syracuse, which by the way, uh, the zip code area, that 13205 zip code area of the south side of Syracuse ranks ninth in the nation in poverty. Now, here's another thing. I was scared of the south side. I was scared of homeless people. I was scared of uh, inner city because I got to go on the east side of town, which is like the really comfortable side of town. That's where the suburbs were. That's where the golf course was that I was at a lot. Um, so here we are down at St. James, and Father Mano was literally asked by the bishop at that time to go down to St. James and close it. It was a very uh, poor parish. Uh, an elderly community. There was no new life coming in, and uh, we were hurting really bad. And we were in debt um, a little over $300,000. So um, he, Father Mano, said to Bishop Moynihan, uh, can I at least get down there and see it? Let me see what's going on. So they said, sure. He comes down to St. James, and he's a young priest who was in his early 30s and had come from a place of outreach ministry in his formation. So he comes down to St. James, and he's trying to get a handle of who's who and what's going on there. And I was one of the first people that he met with because I was always available, because <laughs> I didn't have to work. So. <laughs> So uh, we met, and uh, he says, so, so tell me about uh, what you do here. And at that time, I had just finished what I thought was this beautiful directory for the parish that was outlining all of the ministries, everything that was going on in the parish. And so he's looking at it. I mean, it was like literally fresh off the press. So he's looking at it and flipping through the uh, pages, and he said, well, this is nice. And I thought, nice? <laughs> Do you realize how much time I put into this thing? And you're telling me it's nice? I'm thinking, I don't think I'm going to be able to work with this guy. <laughs> so um, so he's, he's kind of looking through it, and he says, well, um, tell me, is there anything in here that is doing something outside of the parish other than the usual inside the parish ministries? And he says, anything that takes you outside of the brick and mortar? I didn't know what brick and mortar meant. So um, I said, well, wait a minute. I said, we do make sandwiches. 
we make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for the homeless. And I think, oh, yeah, we do it, we do it. And uh, he says, oh, that's great. We can start there. And he said, okay, so now tell me about the men who are eating the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I died. I, it, I, my whole insides just came right out of me. I realized finally that I missed the boat. Unless we can know who we're ministering to, unless we're willing to go outside of the walls, the, the comfort zone, and being with people that are really different and uh, that need the presence of the church, the compassion, the love, the mercy of the church, um, I, 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 I was embarrassed, I was ashamed. Here's a nurse who's compassionate and I couldn't even kind of see that important concept about the church. So I realized that I needed to change. I don't change particularly well or easily. I am the middle child, so you probably know how that is. And uh, being a nurse, you're a little bit, uh, everything's gotta be in order. Um, but that was, this first revelation or first step in this transformation that I could literally at that moment start to feel in me. So we did. We started to change a parish with just peanut butter and jelly sandwiches as long as we took them down to the shelter and met the men. And I said, oh, I, I'm, uh, that's not going to work. And he said, well, what do you mean that's not going to work? I said, well, I'm scared to death. I never go on the south side of the city because it's really dangerous, and I don't think I can do that. And he said, I think you can. And I said, okay, how do you think that? And he says, well, because we're, we're, we're going to, we need to start this kind of movement of uh, evangelization. And now, I'm new, remember? I don't know these words but it scared the heck out of me. And I said, well, what's that? What's evangelization? He says, well, that's when you, we go out and we, we encounter people and we talk to them about uh, mercy and God's love uh, and um, being present to them. And I said, oh dear. I said, please don't ask me to do that. And he said, well, why not? I said, well, I have to be honest with you, Father. Um, I don't know anything about my faith. I said, what if they ask me a question about scripture? What, what if they want to know more about our faith? And I said, I, I, I don't know. I don't understand my faith well enough. I said, if, if, I'm, if you want me to be standing on the street corner and telling people that Jesus loves them, he said, wait a minute, that's not quite what I'm saying. I honestly thought he was going to put me on the south side of the street there. And uh, he said, no, he says, you don't understand. You can do this. He says, all we're doing is being present to people. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to have any magical answers. You just have to be willing to be present to them. And I said, well, present doing what? Maybe giving them a sandwich maybe just saying hello to them. That's all this is about. So I realized at that point in time, I was just hit by a two by four. I, I literally felt as though my world stopped. I was being moved in a direction that I was not anticipating. I was not prepared for whatsoever. Yet, I felt as though this was finally the time in my life that I couldn't say no any longer. I knew somehow that this was going to change me and to move me to where now I was starting to understand that that's where God wants me to be. That all that stuff that had happened all along the way was preparing me 
for this moment in time. And once I felt that sort of revelation or realization, I had a calm and a, uh, a sense of peace come over me literally in that moment. And I s remember saying to myself, you don't need to know what this is gonna look like beyond today. Just allow it to unfold in front of you. You don't have to know the end point because it's gonna continue to change all the time. So there it was. I was kind of ready to roll. I didn't know what we were gonna be doing, but I was on board. So as far as uh, what this thing was going to be, we decided or we came up with a mission statement because I like to have some sort of direction. And so the mission statement of Emmaus Ministry is about performing outreach ministry, including the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. I didn't know what the corporal and spiritual works of mercy were at that time, but I liked it because it was clear to me. And then I would go and I learned about it, I read about it. And if this is all for the purpose of providing love, hope, um, support, the presence of the Catholic Church to the poor, hungry, isolated on the city of, uh, south side of the city of Syracuse. So, as I say, this was made a lot of sense to me. If I look at these, these are a, a, a good where, a place to start. This can give us a direction so that um, we know what feeding the hungry is. We know how to do that. We certainly do that with our families and our social gathering. We use food. We use food, what I call, for the, as the hook. So the, the, you get a hook so that you can get somebody's attention, start to create a relationship, and then from there, who knows where that goes? but it helps us to identify what are the needs of, of the people that we're trying to uh, minister to. So once we kind of got that figured out, um, Father Mano um, helped us to understand that how, how do you know where to go? Who, who are we gonna serve? So we looked at, Father Mano looked at what is inside our geographical parish uh, network? And what he meant by that was what's already in existence. So when we looked at what's inside our parish geographically, not the parish, not the church, but in your geographical location, what's there? Well, for us, uh, we had um, a penitentiary. We had several um, senior citizen um, housing complexes, uh, particularly for people who were disabled. We were very, very close to uh, a number of Catholic charities, um, opportunities there. So that was the first thing, is who can we help in our, our parish boundary right now? And then second, what we did was to avoid a duplication of existing programs. To, to, we, we wanted to connect with the established agencies and service providers that are already happening. Well, we have a great place to start. We went to Catholic Charities. And we met with several program directors there saying, listen, we're here. We're ready to go to work help us to know where the needs are that we don't understand maybe because we'd never done this before. And uh, also, what is, is there a way that we can help you? Can we help you Catholic Charities? And so with that, we were able to, to determine that uh, for us in our location, um, we had a major homeless shelter for men we had a homeless shelter for women on the outside of that geographical location. 
uh, south side of the city, very poor, so of course you've got impoverished neighborhoods. And in that, there was a Catholic Charities after school program. And then along with Catholic Charities, uh, how, um, housing, there was expansion housing that a lot of the homeless people were being placed in. So we kind of had a place to start. So that quickly brought us to um, the men's shelter. And uh, this was very, very new for the men's shelter. They had not had women in the shelter there uh, because women didn't want to go there because it's really scary down there. It was a bad section of town. And I'll give you a quick little uh, example of how we had to uh, kind of get ourselves over that hump, how I had to get myself over that hump, was that um, we needed volunteers, and how was I gonna get women to follow me down to the Catholic Charities Men's Shelter if I'm scared to death? So I um, go out of my office and the school that we had had been sold. It was being used by the uh, uh, sheriff's department for SWAT training. I go over there and I say, excuse me, I need to start an outreach ministry and I'm scared to death. So when we want to take our sandwiches down there to share them with those homeless people, can I call you for an escort? He, he says, I'm really sorry, but that's not what we're here for. And I said, well, this is a really bad section of town. I'm, how am I going to do this? How am I going to convince women to come with me if I can't make sure they're safe? And he said, uh, hold on a second. He ran to his car, comes back with a police-grade um, mace. <laughs> and he said, don't tell anybody where you got this. But he said, I want you to have this. And he said, because it's not safe down there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, so what I did, now we're talking about three miles. So I start in my car, I go up one block towards this really bad section of town, and I turn around and I come back. Next day, I go to that same block, turn around and come back. Next day, I go two blocks now, turn around and come back. It took me a long time. It took me a long time in order to get to the place that I was, I was uh, intending to go and uh, then be able to assure that the women were going to be safe. And the reality is it's because of what we are unfamiliar with is what we're most afraid of. So that was a big uh, uh, lesson for me. So our experience down at the shelter quickly ran, uh, rolled into many different things that the shelter did not have. Uh, we were bringing hot meals. We were bringing uh, coffee and donuts on uh, holiday mornings at six o'clock in the morning because the men had to leave at seven. We were providing haircuts. Well, that's where we learned about the, the men needed socks and toothpaste and toothbrushes. So now we're here and we're creating these relationships. We're talking to the guys, say, what do you need? We'll try to figure out how to bring it to you. That's how that came about. And um, the first time that we were there, the men were surprised, of course, and uh, yet yeah, we were chit-chatting and one fella came up to me at the end and he said, I want to thank you very much for what you've brought here to us. You know, the food was delicious and such and such. And I said, well, you're, you're certainly very welcome. We're honored to be here. And he says, but I have one question. He said, are you going to come back? I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> and then I realized what he was asking. Again, you know, the food and, and the items, they're needed, but they're the... They're, they're less significant than the fact that they wanted us. They wanted presence. They wanted human contact. They wanted to know that they were not so uh, distasteful that we would never want to see them again. That was very transformative for us. So on Holy Thursday, well, the week of Holy Thursday, our first year, uh, about two weeks before that, um, um, 
God's saying things in my head. <laughs> I don't know how else to say that. But um, I had this, this message on my heart that said, you have to wash their feet. I thought, oh, well, I've done that before. You know, a nurse does that stuff all the time. And so I thought, well, we can do that. And I figured out the logistics of that. I go to Father Mano. I says, wait till you hear what, what, what else we can do. Told him about it. And he got just ashen. And he said, oh, my God. He says, we're going to do that Holy Thursday. Now, I'm a little slow on the uptake. Um, but... Um, that's what we did. We got ourselves prepared. We got volunteers. And we were there on Holy Thursday, our first year there. And we had uh, basins where the, the men could uh, soak their feet. And then we had other volunteers who would then clip their toenails, scrub their feet, uh, pumice the calluses, uh, put the powder, lotion, socks, shoes, the whole thing on there. So we're there. And um, the men who I normally presumed didn't know much. You know, they're homeless. They're out there. You know, they're, 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 they're disadvantaged. I'm not realizing I'm going to be learning from them. So uh, the, every single gentleman that came in there said, do you know what tonight is? I said, well, tell me. He said, well, you're the church. You should know. It's Holy Thursday, right? <laughs> I said, yeah. Um, they were telling us that they recognized our presence there and the fact that we were touching them, washing their feet, and being church, that we were reenacting Holy Thursday that night and that we are indeed disciples. So... There's another shift. We're no longer volunteers. I wasn't out recruiting volunteers. I was out trying to recruit people to understand that this is what we're called to do in our church and that we are indeed disciples. So um, this was quite an emotional night. And uh, if you think about it, these men never have somebody touch them in a nice way or a, uh, uh, a gentle way or compassionate way. They're out on the, on the street struggling and, and trying to stay alive on the street. And for them to have people uh, come and do this to them was quite profound to them, certainly, but particularly profound to us. And as you can see, uh, we have, was not difficult to get volunteers to come and do this. So we went from volunteers to disciples. So now, two or three years into this, and I'm wondering, well, where do these men, these people in the homeless shelters go when they have to leave at 7 o'clock in the morning? Because at that time, they could not be there during the day. They didn't have the resources, the staff and stuff. So they were told to leave at 7 o'clock. So I got an idea of I needed to know where they were going. And so I parked myself down at the uh, parking lot, 6.30 in the morning, and watched the men come out, and I followed them. I stalked them. <laughs> I mean, anyway, I did. And I did this a lot. <laughs> but the, the, so the answer is they have no place to go, all right? They're, they're just moving around. They're moving around because they can't be somewhere else. And they're moving into encampments. They're moving under bridges. They're moving into uh, lobbies of uh, places of business or, you know, office buildings sort of thing. Um, they had no place to go. So now we're thinking, wow, wouldn't it be nice if we had a place for them to go? And, and, and recognizing, so that's a need. That's a need. What do we do with that? And that was really quite beyond our uh, financial capability because we're just getting out of debt. We did get out of debt, but still, I mean, to, to do something uh, that significant was uh, financially impossible. And yet it was impossible for us to provide that place of hospitality 
uh, in our church uh, on the campus there because the only place we had was really uh, the basement of where the parish offices and uh, the rectory were. So can't really have people coming in and out of there. So that took us to the street, as I said. And uh, when we're following around, this is often what we find. This is where uh, a lot of them go, or a lot of them are already living. And this is underneath uh, one of the um, interstate uh, bridges that we have in Syracuse. And this is normal. This is normal for them. This is their bedroom. This is their um, like living room habitat for them. This picture I wanted to share with you specifically because uh, this is underneath that same bridge at a different time, but this is, um, depicts how um, we are not any different from anybody else. And we had heard about a gentleman who lived under this bridge that was dying. And he went into the shelter system to die in the shelter system as opposed to under the bridge because he didn't want his friends to worry about what to do with his body. So he passed. We had heard about this. Couldn't believe it because this is all new to us. And so we go down there to see this place. And sure enough, um, Steve is one of the fellow with his back to us here and uh, the other friends of this gentleman that died, whose name was John, uh, were gathered underneath the overpass. And they were just commiserating. They were sharing stories, talking about Steve, laughing, crying, and we show up. And they were amazed that we were there and we identified themselves and they immediately took us in they wanted to tell us all about John. They were so grateful that we made time to find them and to come down and visit. And what does that sound like? Calling hours. They were having calling hours. And they brought us into it and showed us that we aren't any different from each other. We're all the same. We look different, sometimes uh, we're in, in tough situations, but our needs are still the same. So the to the streets uh, looked like um, uh, loading up cars and a van, and we would have uh, items that we might be asked for with us so that we didn't have to run back and forth to where we kept our supplies. So we were out on the streets a lot. So now we are uh, starting to venture into the neighborhood, the more immediate neighborhood of where we live. And we started that by doing popsicle runs. So we had a very hot day. It was like 105 or six degrees. And um, I bought popsicles, put them in a cooler, and uh, we went around uh, the neighborhood and just stopped wherever we saw kids and said, you know, we would identify ourselves, ask the parents, is it okay if we give your, your son or daughter some popsicles? And sure enough, they were fine with it. They wanted to know who we were. I said, well, we're from uh, St. James Parish. And they said, well, is the, what kind of church is that? Well, Catholic Church. They said, wow, boy, our other churches don't do this. We've never seen this before. And the fact that we didn't have an agenda other than just to be present. It wasn't about how we're going to get them to uh, come to St. James and sit in the pews. It wasn't like that. It's just how to meet them where they are and let the relationships uh, evolve. And then in the wintertime, we did um, soup runs. Same sort of idea. Um, so we're now branching into the neighborhoods a little bit more, and we started hosting summer cookouts. Now, uh, we just <laughs> loaded up the, the van, the trucks, and we brought uh, barbecues, grills, tents, games, prizes um, to a uh, site of Catholic Charities of their uh, after-school program and just set everything up 
had a big day for the kids and the, and the uh, parents in the neighborhood. And we did that for about seven years. And each year we would add something to that, uh, which the last year was uh, being able to uh, give away eight bicycles to uh, kids in the neighborhood. But of course, God always wants you to be doing more, right? <laughs> He's always got more plans for us. And um, going back to that place of hospitality kept haunting us. That uh, we, if we could provide a space that anybody was welcome to, um, that's what we were hoping to happen. But the unexpected occurs and Father Mano is reassigned. Oh my goodness, now what do you do? Um, it, it, it was devastating. It, devastating to me in the sense that I felt I, I, I didn't, what am I gonna do? How do I do this? And uh, we had uh, a new priest come in. Uh, he, he knew, knew young priest, but that wasn't his particular focus. You know, his was more youth group and that sort of thing. So. Now it's like, okay, how, how, do, how does this work here? And where, where am I going to get kind of what I need, the leadership, the direction, because this all happened because of a vision of a particular priest. So that was very difficult for me and uh, a particular dry spell for me spiritually. And, um, but again, God provides. And one of the uh, visitors, or I shouldn't say visitors, but one of our disciples that had been with us very early on in our foot washing for Holy Thursday showed up one day. And he just says, uh, you know, I'm, I've been thinking about a soup kitchen down on the south side. And I said, well, that's interesting. I've been thinking about a place of hospitality where we can do some things. And the long and short of it was, um, he knew how to do the business piece of it. It was gonna require us to uh, not be a parish outreach any longer in order for us to be able to incorporate, in order for us to be able to get the funding that we could continue to do the work of Emmaus ministry. And um, so with that, on uh, April 14th, uh, 2016, we did uh, become incorporated. And um, I went to Bishop Cunningham at the time. He was certainly well aware of the work that we were doing uh, on the South Side as throughout the whole diocese. And I went to him and I said, you, you know that we've always kind of had this vision for a place of hospitality. And he said, yes. And I said, well, we have an opportunity to make that happen, um, but I wanna, have your blessing to do that because of what it was going to mean about us shifting into a nonprofit status. And he said, the only thing I ask is, are you going to remain Catholic? I said, yeah, <laughs> yes. So there, there you are. It, it's, it's being able to continue to do the work of the church with, on, with uh, the, the teachings of the church, but to be able to expand it in a way in which we could certainly be able to serve more people. And then uh, May of 2017, we did open up what we call the St. Mary Ann Cope Center for Outreach. And it's actually only about five or six blocks up from St. James. So we had a lot of the St. James volunteers or disciples, you know, move with that. So it wasn't like we had this big separation from uh, a parish setting. And uh, this is uh, what it looks like in our center. Now, this is a dining room, and uh, it was the beginning of uh, many changes in our lives and the lives of uh, the South Side. And again, that hook, uh, providing food, providing uh, clothing, brings them in. We have relationships now with people that we were not even uh, targeting before. Now we're talking about really neighborhoods. Feeding the hungry. And sadly, we see a lot of kids, we do. But it's also very um, heartwarming to be able to 
uh, develop these relationships with uh, the kids and the families that come in. So uh, a little bit of a background as to the sort of things that we see on a regular basis in those that we serve. Obviously hunger, along with that is unemployment, addictions, huge, huge, huge. I'd say about 85% of the people that come into our place have some sort of addictions. I think it kind of just goes hand in hand with poverty and, and, and impoverished areas. So of course you've got crime issues there, uh, a lot of abuse and controlling situations between men and women, unplanned pregnancies, uh, loss of ID. We've got uh, people who are getting jumped down the street and their wallets are gone and their IDs are gone. Or we're getting people that are dropped off from the penitentiary that they just got released and so nobody knows where to uh, drop them off to other than Emmaus Ministry. So a lot of these sort of things, of course, health concerns, homelessness, um, loss of impending utilities, which is huge throughout the year, but particularly now. Lack of transportation is a big one. Um, in order for them to be able to get to where they can um, get public assistance is about three, four miles away. So um, they don't have any way of getting it. They don't even have any way of getting to our place to eat other than walking. So uh, that's a big challenge. And we see a lot of children um, uh, taking care of children. Some of the services that we're providing now, uh, 300 meals a week. We started three years ago. Uh, in the first six months we were open, that first year we served 971 meals. Between January and now, we've served 11,000. So that speaks to the need. That speaks to the fact that these people feel safe. They come to us because they know that we're going to be there. It's, it wasn't one of those drive-by things. They're, they, they know that they are part of uh, what Emmaus is now. We're expanding the number of days that we serve and the number of meals each day that we serve. We also have a food pantry. We distribute about 80, 85 bags of groceries a month. And along with that is 85 bags of um, personal care products like uh, toilet paper, paper towel, and the toiletries because uh, food stamps does not cover any of those items. If you think about it, these people cannot buy toilet paper. It's heartbreaking. Um, shower and laundry ministry was a big thing for us. Uh, because we recognize that the homeless don't always want to be uh, dirty, but they don't have access to a shower. Uh, haircuts, the bus passes, because of the addiction, we have uh, a volunteer, a disciple, that uh, facilitates uh, weekly AA meetings. We're doing children's and family activities now, and uh, ser uh, confirmation service retreats are huge for us. Um, other things that we do here, Foot care, winter clothing, holiday breakfasts, and grief sharing sessions now. I told you about uh, how our numbers have uh, increased. We're seeing more people uh, each week, more new faces, and uh, our grocery bag needs are going up. Uh, we log about 220 volunteer hours a week. Everything is done by volunteers. We have outgrown our space and we're going to be moving into a new facility that was donated to us. Uh, it's twice as big and it's literally out our back door. You can't plan these things. What makes uh, Mayus Ministry unique? 100% um, of our uh, direct guest services are provided by volunteers. Uh, and it's about 70 volunteers a week that... Uh, uh, help make everything happen. Uh, we're, we serve our guests at the table. Uh, we have a very focused network of service opportunities for uh, parishes, diocesan-wide, um, which is uh, really where we get all of our support. A number of our former recipients of our services are now volunteers. We operate solely on uh, private donations. Um, uh, Myself, I've been the volunteer administrator since 2009. Uh, we have just been able to hire a couple part-time positions, and two of those uh, employees 
are um, from the immediate neighborhood. And then we are a, a source for, a, we're like a little satellite program for other services that come to us to make themselves available to our guests. And um, towards the bottom there, it we're really is a place of the unconditional acceptance and the restoration of dignity and value. Uh, this is just a, a, a visual of the number of parishes that we have connected with our ministry on a regular basis. Sister Alma is our most recent volunteer, and she's 92 years old. So, this is where Christ presented himself to us. This is what it's all about. This was not planned, not expected, but Christ presented himself to us through this gentleman who, uh, his name is Mark, and it took a long time for us to get Mark in there because he was um, suffering from a lot of complications from his addiction. And he was just known as the pot, uh, bottle and can man who walked up and down Salina Street and in and out of dumpsters looking for cans in order to get money for his alcohol and to get his food. So, uh, it, as I say, it took about three, four weeks for us to be able to get him to come in there because he was non-communicative. He just didn't even look up. And it speaks to how easily when we uh, don't acknowledge each other, how people just get kind of pushed to the peripheries. And the more we don't acknowledge people, the further they get pushed and they absorb that, that place in the peripheries because of how people like me would have responded to them or ignored them, in other words. So, um, Mark came in, and he was in dire need of um, the ability to uh, have a place to get showered, to have clean clothes, to have something to eat, and he became a, a, like a flower who was opening up. Now he's starting to talk. Now he's starting to say thank you. God bless you. Very simple conversations, but he was changed. And he was changed because he had the opportunity of being uh, given value and dignity in a way that he had not had for many, many years because of his addiction. And things like a simple haircut that can restore somebody's dignity. You know, we know what it's like to, when we get our haircuts <laughs> and how, how it makes us feel so good. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And everybody has that story. So Mark was... Um, uh, I mean, he graduated from uh, high school. He was uh, a star athlete. He was in the Navy. He was honorably discharged, but fell on bad times. So you never know. We don't know who these people are. And uh, through his complications, Mark um, died from his alcohol uh, problems. And we were then able to perform the last corporal work of mercy. So we had Mark's funeral at Emmaus, and his casket was uh, placed at this, the, the area in the, the uh, dining room that was his table. That's where he belonged. And while Mark had no family, he ended up with a family, a family of the disciples, family of the community around that started to recognize, well, you know, who he was and absorbed him into their lives as well. And he was not alone, and he did not end up in Potter's Field where all of the uh, people who have no means or no family are placed. He was put in the Onondaga County Veterans uh, Cemetery, and that's where he rests now. Uh, we have a number of volunteer or, uh, guests who uh, have experienced other uh, life-changing opportunities uh, as a result of the presence of the church in their lives, and a lot of them 
have gone from addiction to sobriety and now are coming to Emmaus to volunteer. And this is our call to service. This is the church. And this is how we can bring the presence of Christ to anybody and everybody. And we can change their lives. We may not uh, be able to change it maybe the way we want them to, to change for themselves, but we can accept them where they're at, support them where they are, help them know that they're loved unconditionally, and that they will have uh, a presence and a place in our hearts. And with that, I want to thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me here today. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. We probably have time for a couple questions. Couple questions? Anybody have a question? Yes. I'm sorry? Uh, well, I, I, maybe I didn't say it well enough like that, but yes, definitely. Uh, Oh, absolutely. And yes, because um, it, like I were talking about with how easily people can get pre uh, pushed to the peripheries by our judgment of them, by our judgment of that they, um, they must be uh, alcoholics or they must be no good, they can't hold a job down or they don't look right or whatever. There's a lot of ways that we do judge people. And a lot of that is in our fear, maybe, of them, but probably more so because we don't know what to do about it. You know, in the, in the earlier years for me, I think my problem was I didn't look at people, I didn't want to look at people who looked to be on the, the peripheries because then I would have to be called into action somehow. And I wasn't ready. So, uh, I, I agree, it, it, it is, we need to not be judgmental so that we can be um, the light, the beacon of hope for somebody who is just as uh, um, forgotten as, as somebody else. Anybody else? How did you get the volunteers? Uh, I'm glad you said that, you know what it is? What, how do you get the volunteers? How do you get the volunteers? Um, and you know what it is? Now, after looking at all this, we have more volunteers than we need, be, and they're coming from the church. They, they are looking for places where they can go to volunteer, where it's not just about doing a task, but that it is connected and related to their faith. And we talk about it all the time. It's about our faith. Um, I do presentations with uh, new uh, prospective volunteers just about that because I want them to know why we do what we do. This isn't just a place to serve some meals. There's a whole other thing about it. And the transformation that we see in people uh, who co even come from you know, strong faith backgrounds is, is huge. Now you take somebody who's kind of, you know, uh, like I was and lost and, and just trying to figure it out. We see a lot of uh, changed lives with them coming because they're experiencing something different. They're experiencing love. They're embracing their faith. It, it means something now. It's kind of connecting. You know, going to church for me early on was, um, well, I went to church, but I didn't know what I got out of it. I left and it's like, well, I, I don't remember even what the, the gospel reading was. When you connect that faith with the act of service, I think is where it all changes. And parents want to bring their kids to a place of service that is exemplifying that. We have a, 
Yeah. So, so again, let's thank Sheila for a wonderful <laughs> presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.